Well, please have your Bibles open at that passage we read together a moment ago, earlier in our service, in Philippians, in chapter 1. Philippians in chapter 1. So then, for the last four or five times when I've been here in this pulpit on a Sunday evening, I've been taking you through the opening to this letter of Paul to the Philippians. And tonight... We move on to verses 7 to 11. So that's Philippians chapter 1 and verse, sorry, verse 9 to 11. Verse 9 to 11. And the title for this evening's sermon is Pray for More and More Love. Pray for More and More Love. Now, last time, if you were with us, we looked at verses 7 and 8, in which the Apostle Paul sets us an example that we should love one another with all the affection of Christ Jesus. Well, now here in verses 9 to 11, Paul continues to set us an example by telling us how he prays for the believers who are in Philippi. And he prays that they may love one another more and more so then christian pastors need to love the members of the church more and more and church members also need to increase their love for their pastors christian husbands need to love their christian wives more and more and christian wives need to increase their love for their christian husbands And Christian parents need to love their their children more and more. And Christian children need to increase in their love for their parents. You see, no matter who we are in the church, uh, no matter what role we have in the life of the church, we need to increase our love for one another more and more. And none of that will happen without prayer. Because it won't happen by your own strength. It won't happen just because you want it to happen. It won't happen just because you roll up your sleeves and really put all your effort into it. And it won't happen because you've read a good book about it. Or because you've completed a course. No, it will only happen with the help of God. And that's why we must pray. We must pray for more and more love between believers. But if we are to pray, if we are to pray that God would give us more and more love for each other, how should we pray? What should we pray for? Well, let me suggest as we look at these verses tonight, that these verses are giving us three things that we should pray for. First of all, Pray for expanding love. Expanding love. Secondly, pray for excelling love. Excelling love. And thirdly, pray for exalting love. Exalting love. Expanding love. Excelling love. Exalting love. This is what we should be praying for. First of all, then, as we look at these verses tonight, we see we should be praying for expanding love. Just look at verse 9. Just glance down at our text and read verse 9 with me. And in verse 9, the Apostle Paul writes to these Christians in Philippi. And he says this. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. In other words, it is Paul's prayer for these Christians that their love should grow and develop, that it should become deeper and truer, that it should enlarge and multiply. Your love for your fellow Christian ought never to just stand still. Your love for your fellow believer ought not to just languish and stagnate. 
No, it should be, it should be thriving. It should be flourishing. And Paul says he pray, prays that our, our love should abound. But what does Paul really mean by that word, love? Well, he means that we should have the same active love for each other that God the Father has for his Son. The same active love that God the Father has for his people. So then it is speaking of a sacrificial love and a humble love and an obedient love and a pure love and a righteous love. And Paul's prayer is that that love should abound. In other words, there should be an abundance of such love between fellow Christians. There should be more than enough. This love should be overflowing out of us. There should be excessive and exorbitant amounts of love shown between believers. And not only should our love abound... But it should abound more and more. With every year that goes by that you're a Christian. With every decade that passes. As you go on and on in the Christian life. Your love for the people of God. It should keep growing. You should never get to a point where you say. Well I've reached my maximum now. You should never say, I can't love my brothers or sisters any more than I do now. You should never be able to say, well, there's no room for growth in love with me. No, your love must always be expanding. It must be abounding more and more. Now, a church where there is no love between Christians, a church where Christians are at war with each other, is a church that is dying. A church that is always fighting and quarreling and arguing within itself is a church that is on the road to disaster. Now you show me a church that is crumbling and falling apart, and I don't mean the building, I mean the people. I'll show you a church that stopped loving each other. You know, it was one of the great sadnesses during the COVID crisis to see a lack of love between certain Christians. I'm not speaking of this fellowship. I am so thankful to God that here in this church, we knew a great measure of harmony and unity and peace during that period. And that's not because we didn't have strong opinions or strong beliefs about the COVID crisis. We certainly did. But it was so wonderful to see the way people really worked hard to love one another and show humility to each other. But sadly, that was not true everywhere. I'm sure you know of churches, I know of churches, where Christians were fighting with one another during the COVID crisis. Where was the kindness? Where was the patience? Where was the tolerance? Where was the humility? So many Christians were bickering and backbiting. And so many Christians were walking out of their churches and resigning their membership. Because of mask wearing or social distancing or vaccine status. Now I'm not saying there are not big questions to be addressed on those topics. There are. But they should be addressed in a spirit of love. And this love that Paul speaks of, this abounding, growing, expanding love. This is not some sentimental, touchy-feely, slushy love that marks so many modern-day churches. No, the Apostle Paul says that our love must abound more and more with feelings and emotions and a, and a woozy sensation. No, that is not what Paul says. He says with knowledge and with all discernment. With knowledge and with all discernment. In other words, this is a thoughtful love. This is an insightful love. When Paul says that our love must abound more and more with knowledge, he means that you've got to have some understanding for one another. We have to comprehend and appreciate and grasp what it really means to love one another. 
You know, our modern world thinks of love as merely an emotion, merely a feeling, only an impulse. But here Paul says, no, your love must abound with knowledge. With knowledge. You must engage your mind. You must think. The primary organ of love is not the heart, it's the brain. You must, you must think to love. You won't increase your love unless you increase your knowledge. You must increase your knowledge of God and your knowledge of his word and your knowledge of his church and your knowledge of his people. For without that knowledge, there can be no love. And it also must be love with discernment. With discernment. The Apostle Paul says, our love must abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. You must have insight. You must be perceptive. You must be aware of the needs of others, aware of each other's burdens, aware of each other's joys, aware of each other's weaknesses, aware of each other's strengths. And it means that you've got to develop good judgment, including in ethical matters. That's what Christian discernment means. It means good judgment based upon the knowledge of God and his word, especially in ethical matters. You can't love each other without having discernment. And this then is Paul's prayer for these Christians in Philippi. He says, I pray for you that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. So let me ask you all who are here in church this evening. When you go into your room and you shut the door and you pray, as Christ commanded us to do, that's how Christ commanded us to pray. Go into your room, shut the door, and pray. Do you pray like this? Do you pray that your love for your fellow believer may abound? more and more with knowledge and with discernment is this part of your prayer life that we should love one another more and more do you pray that your love would grow continually pray that your love would grow around the clock day after day week after week month after month year after year decade after decade and are you praying that your love will increase with knowledge. Knowledge of God and of his word and of his kingdom and of his church and of his people. Are you praying that your love will grow with discernment, with insight and perception and with wisdom? Do any of you lack wisdom tonight? Ask God who gives generously without finding fault and he will give it to you. That is the first thing then we are being told of here in these verses, we should pray for expanding love. But secondly, we see that we should pray for excelling love, excelling love. Just look at verse 10 now. Just read verse 10 with me. And in verse 10, the Apostle Paul gives his reasons for why our love should abound more and more. He says in verse 10, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Now let me just try and unpack that verse for you. The Apostle Paul says that your love should increase so that you may approve what is excellent. Approve what is excellent. Now what does Paul mean by that? What is Paul driving at? Well, when he uses the word approve... He means it in the sense of testing or examining or trying something. You know, the word has its root in the method for testing metal or coins to determine whether they're genuine, to determine their value. And Paul is saying, look, if you, if you love your fellow believer and if your love is growing more and more with all knowledge and with all discernment, 
then you will be able to truly determine what is valuable. And Paul says you ought to be looking for that which is excellent. You should be looking for that which is excellent. Now what does Paul mean by that? What does Paul mean by excellent? He's talking about the things that surpass this world. You know, this world values things like power, success. And this world values outer beauty and riches. And this world values fame and, and fortune. And things that are entertaining. Things that tickle our ears and things that dazzle our eyes. But Paul is saying, if you have love for your fellow believer, a love which is truly growing and abounding more and more with knowledge and discernment, then you ought to be able to determine the value of things that surpass this world. And without wishing to offend any of you who are here tonight... There is no one in this church building to, tonight who would attract the love or approval of this world. We have no celebrities here. We have no powerful politicians here tonight. We have no billionaires here. We have no catwalk models. We've got no rocket scientists. We have no tech giant CEOs. These are the things that the world would prove of as excellent. But we have something more. We have something more gathered here tonight. We have the unsearchable riches of Christ Jesus. And those unsearchable riches are seen in the lives of ordinary Christian men, women and children who are trusting in the gospel and loving their brother and their sister. When our love for each other grows and grows and abounds more and more with knowledge and with discernment, then we can truly see the value of the things that are excellent. That's what Paul means when he says you can approve the things. You can see the value in things that are excellent, that excel, that go beyond what this world can offer. Now, does your love for your fellow believer really excel in that way? Do you really have that sort of excelling love? Do you have a love that can really approve what is excellent? Or do you still treasure the things of this world? Do you still value the things of this world? Do you still approve the earthly things, the material things, the fleshly things, the physical things? Do you only love your brother and sister in Christ if there's someone important, someone significant, someone attractive? That is the way of the world. It is not the way of Christ. If you approve only those things, then you do not have love. But if your love is abounding in all knowledge and discernment, you will approve, you will value the things that are truly excellent. And so, Paul goes on to say, and so you will be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Now what does Paul mean by pure? What does he mean by pure and blameless? Is he saying that we can achieve sinless perfection here in this world? No, when Paul says pure, he means it in the sense of being sincere. Sincere. The word that Paul uses here, it carries the idea of being, being pure, especially when examined by the sunlight. The Greek word that Paul uses here uh, originally has its roots in describing a piece of, well, a piece of fine pottery that was, you could, you could tell its value when you held it up to the sunlight. You know, you, you take a piece of fine pottery and you'd hold it up to the sunlight and you'd see whether there are any cracks in it. Because in the ancient world, um, there were some devious merchants. There are devious merchants in every age. But in the ancient world, there were devious merchants who used to fill in those cracks with, uh, with wax. And you couldn't see it in normal light. But when you held it up to the sun and the sun's rays shone through it, 
if it was all cracked and fractured, you could see it. And you could see that it was fake and you could see that it was phony. That's the word that Paul uses here for pure. So when Paul says that you will be pure, what he means is you will be genuine. You will be sincere. You will be authentic in your love for each other. He's talking about sincerity. You see, the love that we have for one another, it ought not be fake or phony. Because that's easy to do. You can just pretend. You can read your Bibles and, and see that we're meant to love one another. So I'll put on a show. I'll make sure everyone can see that I'm loving to my fellow Christian. Well, that's just artificial. That's just manufactured. You're not to have that kind of love. Our love for each other, it should not be counterfeit. We shouldn't just fill in the gaps with wax and hope that we can get away with it. You know, there are many so-called Christians who do make a pretense of loving the people of God. They're filled with charm and charisma. They've got a very, very polished presentation of themselves. But when you hold them up to the light, the light of God's truth, you find that the cracks begin to show. And our love ought not be like that. Our love should be pure, meaning sincere. And likewise, our love should be blameless, blameless. And literally what Paul means is not causing anyone to stumble, including yourself. True Christian love does not lead other people into sin. You know, there is a progressive movement within the wider church today which claims to be promoting the love of God. And it does so by throwing away the Bible's teaching on, on controversial ethical questions. But that is just leading people into sin. That is just causing them to stumble into sin. And it is the very opposite of what Paul is saying here. He is saying that our love, yes, it must abound more and more with knowledge and with discernment so that we may approve, we may value what is truly excellent and so that we may be pure, meaning sincere, and blameless, meaning not leading others into sin. So then, our love must be pure, and blame us so that we may be ready for the day of Christ. Now, what does that mean? What does Paul mean when he says, be ready for the day of Christ? He means the day that Christ returns. When Christ returns to this world and gathers all his people to himself, he seeks a people who love each other. He seeks a united church, a harmonious, peaceful church. A church where all the love that he has shown to them is shown by them to each other. And we must be ready for that day. Oh, what a shameful thing it would be if Christ returned when we were at war with each other. When we were fighting and arguing and quarreling with each other. What a shameful thing that would be. Be ready for the day of Christ. Make sure your love is pure and blameless. Make sure it is sincere and not leading others into sin. The church of Christ must continue to love the people of Christ until the day of Christ. You see, this is not just an instruction given by the Apostle Paul to the Christians in Philippi during the first century. No, it is an instruction to all believers in every city, in every place across the globe, and in every century until the return of Christ, that we must have an excelling love. So let me ask you this evening, does your love excel in this way? Are you praying that you might have excelling love? Are you praying for a love that will help you to approve, to value what is excellent? Are you praying for a love that will be truly authentic and genuine? Are you praying for the kind of love that will not lead yourself or others into sin? And are you praying for a love that will continue all the way to the day of Christ? 
Here the Apostle Paul is showing us, by his example, that we should pray for more and more love. First of all, we must pray for expanding love. Secondly, we must pray for excelling love. And now thirdly and finally, we must pray for exalting love. Exalting love. Now just look at verse 11 with me. Just read verse 11 with me. And in verse 11, the Apostle Paul says that he wants us to be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is the love that we ought to have for one another. A love that exalts, that glorifies, that praises God. We do not love one another so that we can praise ourselves or glory in ourselves. We love one another so that we might praise and glorify God. Now let me show you a number of things about this exalting love. For one thing, it is a love that is filled with the fruit of righteousness. Now when you became a Christian, you were declared righteous in the sight of God. You were clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And that's true. The moment you became a Christian, the moment you repented and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, you were clothed in his righteousness. But there is also a sense in which our righteousness must be pursued. Our righteousness must be a progressive thing which grows as we mature in the Christian faith. That our righteousness ought to grow like a fruit This is practical righteousness. And it's shown in the way you live your life. And it's shown in the way you love your fellow believer. It's not something that you can create artificially. No, Paul says it comes through Jesus Christ. It comes through Jesus Christ. In other words, this is a righteousness that is supernatural. It is above and beyond our natural selves. We are not born naturally with this righteousness. You can't just create this righteousness by attending church or going on a course or performing good works. It is only through Jesus Christ. It comes to you through Jesus Christ. So you've got to know him and you've got to love him. And you've got to serve him. And you've got to obey him. And you've got to follow him. And you've got to trust in him. And if you haven't done any of those things. Well then you can't love in the way that the Apostle Paul is urging you to love. Because it all comes through Christ Jesus. This exalting love is a love that is filled with the fruits of righteousness. That comes through Christ Jesus. But its goal, its target, its objective is the glory and praise of God. If you're just loving your fellow believers so that you can give yourself a great big pat on the back and tell yourself what a wonderful Christian you are, if you're just doing it to congratulate yourself, you are missing the whole point. We are to love one another so that it might give glory and praise to God. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth and he reminded them in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 31... So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. That is our number one objective. That is our top priority. That is our primary concern. That we should give praise and glory to God. Now maybe you think... The work of evangelism gives glory to God, and it certainly does. And maybe you think the work of preaching gives glory to God, and indeed it does. Maybe you think the work of missionaries overseas gives glory to God, 
And indeed, it does. But here, in Philippians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is showing you that at the most basic, primary, central level, you can give glory to God by simply loving your brother and sister in the Lord. So let me ask you this evening, are you committed to loving one another in this way? Is your love filled with all the fruits of righteousness? Is your love filled with joy and peace and patience and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control? And do you recognize that you can't fake this kind of love? It's got to come to you through knowing Christ the Lord. It's got to come through a living, personal relationship with Jesus. If you don't have that, you can't have the love that we're talking about tonight. And is your love giving glory and praise to God? It must be an exalting love. Well, I hope then, as we've considered these verses, verses 9 to 11 of Philippians chapter 1, that you've been stirred in your heart to go away tonight in the quietness of your own room and pray for more and more love. And I hope that you've been shown how to pray for more and more love. I've hoped that you've learnt that you can't just be a loving Christian on a Sunday. You've got to be a loving Christian tomorrow on bank holiday and on Tuesday You've got to be a Christian 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that means you've got to love your fellow believer. Well, may God give us all a desire to pray for more and more love, to pray for an expanding love, to pray for an excelling love, and to pray for an exalting love. Let's pray now. The Lord God and our loving Heavenly Father, we have not gathered here tonight so that we can stand over your word, examining it and judging it. Rather, your word stands over us and examines our hearts and judges our hearts. Father, we pray that you will give us an abounding love that grows more and more so that we might truly value what is really excellent. Father, we pray that our love might be genuine and authentic, not fake, not phony. And we pray that in it all, that your name might be greatly praised and greatly honoured. Father, if we failed in this, if we have let you down in this regard, we confess it now. But we pray that you might fill up our hearts with more and more love for each other so that we are ready for the day when you return. And we ask it all in the Saviour's precious name. Amen. Amen.